the state is. Uh, I'm cool. Um, it might be some common connection. Uh, it might imply some kind of stability, too. But, 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 perhaps it's about the Earth. Maybe it's physical objects in, in contact with the Earth. It might be saying something about the Earth's charge state. It might even say something about the distance from the center of mass of the Earth, but we don't know for sure. Or um, may it also say something about gravitational potential energy, which is uh, an interesting concept in itself. So let's talk about grounding gravity. So if we talk about gravitational potential energy, we have this nice conservative field. It doesn't matter what path you take to get someplace. The difference between the two just uh, tells you what the energy state change is. And uh, we write this in physics with mgh. But what's, that's, you know, mass and uh, gravitational acceleration and height. But what's height? Height compared to what? Well, does that go all the way into the center of the mass of the, of the Earth? Or does it go to the surface? Well, it's kind of a relative thing. It's a change in state. And, you know, if there's no Earth at all, then there's no reference point, and we're left back with Newton's law of gravitation which just tells you what the force is between two objects in space. And it depends on the distance and the mass and a nice uh, big fat constant called g. And this is very much like voltage. So voltage is an electric potential in between two places in an electric field. So we just have some distance between these two things. And it talks about the, uh, a little bit about in a sort of uh, uh, demassified way, the uh, amount of energy it might take to move something, two charges closer together or keep them apart or something like that. And so it has some relationship to work and potential energy, but without the mass involved. And again, this is another conservative field. But um, is there a ground for voltage? So in the way I described it here, there's just a difference in the position in this electric field. But where's zero? Zero is not anywhere. I mean, it could be somewhere out at infinity, but it might take a long time to get there. If you get there, please tell me about it. I'd like to learn. <laughs> but I haven't seen this place. So um, there's some difficulty in trying to describe what ground might be in terms of voltage. Now, current, of course, has uh, no real reference either. It's just the time rate of change of charge. And uh, this, of course, shows up in Maxwell's equations. But this is a time derivative, so it's a time rate of change. The charge is flowing by. There's no real zero point. You just look at what happens over time. So we don't find ourselves with a nice reference point here either. Now, if we look at circuits, we have these uh, reference points that we reference, as I mentioned before, in one of these schematics. Uh, sometimes we, have, we take that and we connect it to the chassis. And uh, we call that ground. And sometimes we connect it to shields and things. And sometimes it's even a current return path, which has its own <coughs> problems. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But when we start doing this, we get really confused because we have these digital grounds and analog grounds. So what does that mean? So you have one ground for one thing, one ground for another thing. You're trying to isolate them with, uh, so that the noise doesn't creep from one side of the circuit to the other. But that in itself implies that these two things are not the same. And uh, when we rejoin them, we sometimes get good results and sometimes don't, depending upon the current and the shielding and lots of other things. And if there's some kind of voltage differential, then we get a ground loop. And uh, often we have a, a current return path through the ground, and it, the circuit kind of looks like this. There's something that we call some common reference here with this symbol, and then there's some resistance in the ground. And so if the current flows like from here through that, it's actually going to change that reference point. And so we don't know quite what the voltage will be. If we measure the voltage right there between those two points, we'll measure one thing. But if we measure 
lasers are a really uh, cheap and dirty way to avoid doing differential equations. Um, and uh, you can use them for impedance as well. If you've studied the extra test, there are actually questions on there that are phasers. So that you get to combine impedances by using complex algebra. And the vectors can actually rotate with time. Here's an example of what it looks like. And it's actually rotating with the equation u to the minus j omega t. If you've been an electrical engineer, you got sick of hearing about that. But um, the thing with this uh, phasor notation is that it only works at a particular frequency. So it's uh, for monochromatic signals. But the vector sums really uh, simplify calculations, especially when you're dealing with like three phases like this. So you can actually expect to get an answer uh, without having to grind through a bunch of calculus just by doing some algebra. When it comes to impedance, uh, this is the part from the ham exams. You can actually take a circuit that's somewhat complicated and uh, break it down for a particular frequency into some algebra that's actually quite tractable. Uh, but you have to be very careful not to overapply this. Uh, and you've seen this, of course, um, in the ham radio world because it's so easy to operate at one frequency. But of course, everything changes at a different one. You can add phasers just uh, by decomposition into real and imaginary, or you can do tip to tail vector addition and vector subtraction. It's really fast and easy. So, uh, really nice technique for looking at some of this complicated stuff. Anyhow, getting back to our story, in three phase uh, home wiring or, or, or plant wiring or whatever, we have a couple of different configurations people deal with. Deal with. And these are the delta and the y configurations. Maybe you've seen these before. And in the y configuration, we do have this cool thing that comes out called a neutral. And the neutral might be considered some kind of groundish thing. It tends to be sort of at a zero volt point relative to these other things, as long as there's not a lot of current going on. But you can transform the y configuration into the delta configuration completely. You can do this with a, some simple algebra. And then, where's zero volts? We don't have an easy notion of ground to deal with anymore. Um, what, where would it be? It's kind of all uh, relative to each other. And we can see this a little more clearly if we look at split phase. So in the split phase world, we might take two of those phases, put them in the input to a transformer, and then pull off um, our other split phases here. We have a couple of voltages and a neutral in the middle. But that neutral has been decoupled from the other phases by the magnetic coupling in the transformer. So it's really isolated. And so is that ground? That's just another arbitrary voltage that might be floating in a very different place than some other ground, unless you pull it there. So we don't really know what that is either. And we have all of these conventions where we connect some of this stuff to the Earth. And we, uh, all the electrical codes say, yeah, you have to hook it to the water pipes or hook it to the earth or stick this thing in the ground. And the really interesting thing is that the earth is a really lousy conductor. It uh, varies with all sorts of different environmental factors, including the composition of the earth itself. And uh, can you still be hurt if you're standing on the ground and you grab something that might 
in some other place, it could be radically different. Now, we're hands, of course, and we're going to talk about RF. What if we increase the frequency at RF? We get a lot of coupling because RF tends to propagate through free space and propagate through objects as well. And um, those objects may have dielectric um, properties and diamagnetic properties that change the, the way it propagates. Um, but you can see here that we, uh, just for the dielectric properties in these different kinds of soil, we get different dielectric properties. And does this really do anything to uh, enhance the signal? Uh, it's unclear. Does it do something for safety? That's really unclear. So if we increase the frequency even further um, to VHF, what we find is as we go up in frequency, the dielectric properties are even frequency dependent, and they tend to even out a little bit. But that doesn't help us very much. It might help us to predict where the signal will refract, but it's not going to do a whole lot to make our station a safe place to be. But of course you ask, don't antennas need a ground? You know, we've all heard about uh, antennas with grounds, right? But if an antenna is really balanced, it doesn't really need a ground, per se. So as long as those currents are flowing up and flowing back, then what's a ground? We just have a dipole in the air. And uh, we may have some of that RF being siphoned off somewhere else. But that doesn't mean we need a ground, so to speak. And uh, even things like Yagi's are, uh, that have these uh, gamma matches and such, are, are actually still pretty well balanced and have a slight tweak in the pattern. But uh, gamma match is sort of like a delta match pushed out a little bit, and the delta match is nice and symmetric. So um, there's really not much to unbalance this unless you put it near something else, and then some of the RF energy is going to go in there and change things, change the propagation of the currents a little bit. But uh, this is not really a ground notion. This is just sort of uh, how does the RF propagate through the dirt? Now, what about ground planes? We even call them ground planes, right? So they must have a ground. But they don't, really. Um, what those things sticking out to the side that are uh, called radials do is they provide sort of a reflective surface that makes it look like it's a dipole, only turned vertically. And so it, um, it kind of provides this way of making the antenna a little bit shorter and easier to deal with in some sense. I mean, both geometries are problematic in their own way. But um, it's not really ground, per se. We do sometimes put these radio wires on the Earth's surface. And in that case, they get detuned a bit. They get detuned by the various properties of the soil. In fact, sometimes they can waste some energy heating up the soil if a lot of that RF energy goes through there. And it's somewhat conductive, but not really conductive. You can get all sorts of uh, energy that's just lost there. And that's why we like to put a lot of radials on to suck up our energy and keep it from going into the earth. Now, we have these other things called balance. And balance, connect to ground, right? It's balanced and unbalanced or something like that. But not really. They're just kind of transformers. Now, it might be an auto transformer, or it might be a traditional transformer, balanced one. And what it does, it provides this magnetic coupling that might shift impedance or might even allow things to be at different voltages still have the same sort of current characteristics. But uh, that's not really a ground. It might connect to a chassis or something. But uh, I wouldn't call that an absolute reference to anything that I can imagine. As hams, we're told that uh, we should never use the neutral or the, the, the safety thing as the ground for our ham station. And so instead, what the amateur radio handbook says is to drive some piece of copper or something into the ground is an did, right? And so that will be your ground. So we make these ground rods, and, and it's really hard to put these things in, isn't it? You know, people get in there with the water and the, you know, the shoveling and the, and the whole thing. You hire people to do this because it's such a pain. Yeah, sure. I'll get to that. <laughs> I wouldn't leave that out. Okay, so, um, so you have this ground rod, but why are you using it? Um, yeah, they, they do that too. And uh, there's all these requirements.
that I think are good principles to follow if you want to live in this world where nothing is certain anymore, now that I've knocked you all up your feet, um, is to shield, isolate, and stabilize. Now, shielding is of the Faraday variety. So you build a metal box, and you enclose it tightly in the metal uh, shielded box, and this tells us that uh, there'll be no electric field enclosed, which means there'll be no magnetic field, too. So you can shield things pretty well. They don't have to be perfectly shielded, of course. But um, this keeps us from inducing voltages and, and having currents flow where we didn't expect them. So we can put things like my, uh, uh, I have an amplifier that's in a box. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, but that really keeps the fields from getting in or getting out um, and keeps it, uh, keep things where we want them to be. And this is my amplifier. Um, one of my uh, SB200s, I have a couple of these, and you see all those metal panels there, they're Faraday shielding. I try and keep all of that RF stuff that's in there in and all the other RF stuff out. So you really need tight connections for this stuff. You've got to have a good, good conductivity in the materials, especially as you get up in frequency as things move to the surface, um, and you want to drive that heat field to zero. Um, the next principle is to isolate. There's lots of different signal paths in between things. And you'll notice that whoever drew the schematic actually had a ground. Uh, but <laughs> we'll ignore that for the moment. But to just put something in between all of the subsystems so that unintended signals aren't flowing in between them. Because you could have currents that flow, for example, between the computer and the controller and might make the controller confused about what the, com the computer is trying to say to it. So we do this fairly often with ferrite chokes. Um, to try and get the currents balanced, kind of short out that differential magnetic field, and um, it, it acts like a low-pass filter. So uh, I just clip them on everywhere that I can, and that's the low-pass filter aspect there. Um, and that, that keeps a lot of this RF from going where I don't intend it. Um, if, if you've ever heard me talk about this, I talk about sprinkling ferrites all over your ham shack. And this will solve a host of problems if you have good ferrite mix. And so it makes a reasonable low-pass filter. So uh, just wrap them as many times as you can uh, to create a multi-turn inductor, and then just sprinkle them wherever. Yes? You're talking about the permeability of the mix? Yeah, that's right. And some of it uh, doesn't uh, work well at higher frequencies, and some works really well at lower frequencies. There's all sorts of different uh, ceramic uh, combinations that are available. And the data are all on the website where you order these things. Now, and last but not least, is stabilizing. You want to use what seems like a low impedance local to where you are, um, and where you are is probably near the radio. And one of the most unpleasant experiences is to touch something on the radio and feel this kind of burning sensation in the tips of your fingers. You really don't want to be there. It's not a good thing. I've had the experience. <laughs> and so what you're trying to do is reduce these voltage differentials at least close to you in the radio um, so that uh, it's at a minimum. And you can actually do this with some counterpoises. And uh, yet, they're like quarter wave radiators that uh, convert the impedance. So they're open at one end, and the other end becomes your radio. And I do it with a big bundle of wires like this. And you have one wire per band. You can even bundle them together, detuning them slightly. but and you'll get a lot of high voltage at the very tips of those wires, so you can kind of bend them over and take them or something. Yeah? So the counterpoise reduces the voltage between the radio and what? Yeah, between the radio and you who are a nice little antenna out in there in that field. And that's all. So um, you, get, uh, you get to not get burned as much, and hopefully not at all. In fact, I don't get burned. So in all of this discussion, what happened to our ground rods? Well, outside of lightning, I think, you're wasting your time. Um, and in fact, in many people's experience, they, uh, they make the situation worse. They drag a lot of noise uh, from the outside into your radio, which is kind of an unpleasant experience. Um, you can actually uh, lose a lot of energy by pumping a lot of energy into the earth and having that uh, go into that resistor there and be dissipated as heat, which is not what you want. And uh, on a portable antenna, why just disconnect the thing? So many of you know that one of my favorite portable antennas is the Pac-12. I don't think 
great little two pound antenna and it has a spike in the bottom if you drive it in the earth right near the feed point. And I originally saw this thing and it had that spike connected to the shield of the coax. I thought, well, that's crazy. That's a waste. I just took it off and the antenna works better, as you would expect. Now, I, uh, of course, operate, as many of you know, from the second floor apartment. There's my antenna sticking up there. Uh, it's gone through a few revs. It's a helically wound vertical dipole. I have about uh, 700 watts going on 40 meters at least, and not a single round. And I'm okay to uh, live to tell the tale. And I do indeed have those, uh, those counterpoises running around and lots of ferrites to make sure that things don't get into the wiring in the house. And that's, that's basically the, the deal. Everything is shielded. I have lots of isolation, and I have lots of stabilization. And I can sit there with my 700 watts, even though I'm fairly close to that antenna, believe it or not, and no problems at all. And you might ask, what is a counterpoise? We talked about this uh, a little bit. It's, it's like a quarter wave monopole, and quarter wave link uh, conductors convert impedance, and as would a three quarter wave link every uh, if you shift out a quarter wavelength, then every half wavelength it repeats. Um, and that's the way things are. Every quarter wavelength you get inversions. And so you have you want to try and make the low impedance point be where the radio is and let the high impedance point be somewhere else. And you can actually lay these things along your baseboards. That works fine. It doesn't have to be a perfect system. It's a lot better than nothing. Um, but they do have to roughly match the operating frequency, so you cut them for about a quarter wave and uh, just string them around as best you can, and they work like a champ. But really, do watch out for that high voltage at the end, because uh, you can get burned, something else can get burned. Please uh, put some insulation there. Yes? Sir? Is there anything you gauge you need? Should you have like a... Not a lot of current can, flowing there. Can, can you know, like I use a, like a number 16 wire, I think, something like that, stranded, and uh, put lots of duct tape on the end, and would like that. <laughs> yeah. So if you're really concerned about RF exposure in this environment, the better your balanced your antenna is, the less you'll have to deal with that. So um, it's there as a safety measure. Um, so make your have a nice balanced dipole and uh, put a nice current choke on, and uh, you shouldn't have to worry about that at all. This is all to make sure you're safe. So it won't keep your coffee warm. No, at least it hasn't succeeded in keeping my coffee warm. <laughs> Now, um, you could put radials on the ground like this, as we talked about earlier. <coughs> they provide the mirror, and they're going to be detuning thing, detuned by being on the ground, so to speak. But uh, one of the things that most people miss is they don't put enough of them down to actually effectively take the place of the earth underneath the antenna. And uh, how many of you have gotten some kind of like MP1 super antennas with four radials? Yeah, four is hardly adequate. Try 16 as a starting point. Um, I use uh, 39, so I think, something like that, and uh, stretch them out as much as you can because you really want to keep the conduction path um, on those wires instead of in the earth because that's really inefficient. And if you're operating QRP, boy, you want every ounce of power you can get in. This is all it was recommended. I don't know about that. I mean, you need this conduction path back to the feed point. So I don't think that's going to do exactly what you want. It may modify the pattern, though. Yes? I've had uh, some success with um, aluminum screening as a, a ground plane under my 10 meter uh, vertical. Yeah, that can work. Aluminum screening, of course, you don't know how it's bonded together. So you might get Probably uh, not. oxidation problems there over time. And that would cause rectification. That would be really bad. But um, you really don't need it to be complete. Uh, some there, I've uh, read a couple of uh, things, maybe even in QEX, where the, the, the point of diminishing returns is about 60 radials, something in that neighborhood. Uh, so if you think that the difference between 4 and 16 is really big, 16 and 40-ish is somewhat better, but then it starts being not worth as much. So uh, just get off the floor and get rid of the 4. And uh, these are made out of uh, 
a, uh, what do you call it, a ribbon cable. And uh, my recommendation is always three conductors for each one of those radials, and it has nothing to do with the electrical properties. It's all about how it tangles. <laughs> and so if you do three per or more, preferably three, and then maybe you'll have one left over. And then if you wind it up like taffy, you know, just on top of each other, and then you put a rip tie on it or something like that, and then when you uh, finally go to deploy the antenna, you just take one end, take the rip tie off, and just throw it. Um, it's usually not very tangled, and then you just pull each radial out from the center and deploy them to the four compass points and then fill in bit by bit. Uh, it works really, really well. Yeah? You would mention that they don't, they don't have to be tuned either. They're multi-band. On the ground, no, because they're going to get detuned anyway. So you're just looking for coverage. If you so elevate them a couple of feet, then you want tuning. How long do you generally uh, like it? Uh, quarter wavelength-ish on the band I'm interested in, but that's not always practical. As long as I can tolerate. Um, I have some that are like 16 feet long, some that are 22 feet long. Uh, just whatever I feel like lugging around that day. So what I do is I have you know a, a small set that's for operating really portable, and then I have another set that I combine with that, just put on the same lug, and it, uh, it works fine. So what do you do with these ground lugs? You know, on the back of your radio, you got a ground lug. Uh, maybe you want to tie these together so that everything's sort of at a common voltage. If they're nice and close together, you might use some of this low inductance braid. Uh, but it's not really all that important. Uh, you connect this whole mess to the counterpoise bundle, and that'll give you your stabilization you're looking for. I wouldn't connect it to the ground rod, certainly not there. And we'll talk about why in a moment. But, you know, as I was preparing this talk, I looked at my own radio to see what the state of affairs was and discovered that uh, the ground braid wasn't even connected. <laughs> Who knew? But did it make any difference? No, not really. It was fine because the coax was conducting uh, most of that and, and keeping the voltage, like really short pieces of coax were keeping the voltages relatively stable. Now, you all have H HTs, right? Well, they don't have a ground. They're just kind of sitting out there, and it has like half an antenna, but what's the other half of the antenna? You. You, that's right, the water bag, the, the salt bag. Um, so, um, that's a pretty inefficient other half of the antenna, so why not add some wire that's a much better conductor than your body is? Um, and maybe your body won't get warm either. And so you can put a uh, quarter wavelength piece of wire on the ground side and uh, dangle that down, and it starts looking a lot like a dipole. And it starts working a lot like a dipole, too. You'll get uh, several dB improvement out of this thing. It's not a ground, it's just the other half of the antenna. And do watch out, actually, the end of those things even at five watts, it tingles. I've had that experience, too. Now, what is a case for ground? Well, lightning is sort of a case for ground. And in order to understand lightning, we kind of have to go back to DC. We've been talking about AC things up until this point. But um, what happens uh, in, when you have lightning is you have these clouds, and they have a particular charge state, and then the Earth under the clouds, and they have a very different charge state. And those charge states really want to equalize. So there's, there's force there, there's, there's a strong electric field. They want to make themselves at the same charge state if they can swing it somewhere. And what we want is a really safe way to discharge it, hopefully not for you or your radio. If we look at lightning strikes, <coughs> uh, we get this plasma that forms. We don't understand every aspect of how this works. But the basic mechanism is that there's this very intense E field. And a plasma forms and then uh, sort of starts ripping the electrons away from the nuclei, and that becomes a conduction path. And then at some point, it conducts and equalizes, hopefully, again, not mentioned if I recall correctly. And they seem to attract lightning. And the reason for this is that the charges around a sharp radius curve like that uh, don't have as much mutual repulsion because of the, the uh, curvature. And so they tend to accumulate in this uh, sharp area. And that causes a more intense electric field. And that intense electric field starts stripping these uh, electrons and uh, the nuclei apart more easily because there's more electric force available. And then, boom, it conducts and hopefully conducts down to something into the Earth. In this case, we do want it to go into the Earth. 
because there's a patch of charge down there that we want to equalize with the uh, charge that's sitting in a cloud. And of course, antennas are a lot like lightning rods. They have lots of sharp edges, you'll note. They may not all be pointing up, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, it, and if it's a vertical, it really likes it. So they make very efficient conductors for lightning. And the reason you would so so-called ground these things or put them conduct, make them have easy conducting paths for the patch of earth underneath those clouds is so that you don't get toasted by this thing. Now, should your antenna coax go to ground in this situation? Well, it's probably a bad idea because you don't want that current flowing in your house, right? I don't think that's a good idea, do you? No. So, what you want is the current to flow outside the house and find a nice path to something else so that it doesn't flow inside your house and just toastify your radio. And what many people do is they take their antenna and their coax and they bring it into the house and they plug in the back of the radio and then from the back of the radio they connect that to their ground rod. Does that, does that sound like a good plan to you? No. It doesn't sound like a good plan to me. And so proper lightning uh, uh, hygiene, if you will, and I've verified this with people who do professional installations on this stuff, is to have a conduction path outside, maybe using one of these uh, fusible polyphaser devices or something like that, to make sure that the current goes out, not in. And so you want it to go through the protection device, use the protection device, that's fine. And things will just keep on running, even during a heavy lightning strike. But if you don't do it right, the front end of your radio is gone, and maybe even the whole radio. So uh, the best plan, if you absolutely don't know that this is all right and tested, is to take that coax out of the back of your radio and throw it out the window. Because you don't want that in your house. I think that would be an unpleasant experience. and also high current carrying capacity. So, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Not just a wire. Yeah, not just a wire. You want something that's, I mean, there's lots of amps. I mean, uh, many orders of magnitude more amps than you're used to. Ed, do you have something? Commercial broadcast station antennas are designed to take a direct hit by a lightning strike. Generally, amp tray antennas will not stand up to that. Well, they will, actually. If you live in a lightning-prone area, people do engineer their systems so that they work. Um, and it can be done without any problem. It's just that out here, we're not as used to it because we get very, very few lightning strikes, but it's always possible. And you do want to pre prepare for this. Um, yeah. So you throw the coax out the window so it hits the ground and it's grounded? Something like that, right. Well, so it gets to that patch of charge. Well, yeah. Yeah, if, if, if lightning really hits, you will uh, lose your cable anyway because it appears yeah. to mention the coins are really <laughs> high. They go up to 100,000 amps. And so it's not unusual if you have an aluminum antenna that it evaporates. Yeah, you can you can uh, you can lose bits and pieces of your antenna system, but it's a lot better than losing things in your house. And uh, I was talking to a guy uh, at Yuma who uh, does uh, commercial broadcast installations, and he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, they just you know wrap a lot of huge wire around the heliax, and stick that into the ground, and you get this uh, lightning strike, and you just hear this boom, but everything keeps on going." Well, of course, yeah, there's a lot of charge and a lot of electric force, and so it wants to move quickly, and it does. And um, these polyphaser devices rely on that supply. Yeah, so it can arc into the discharge. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, I used to work for PG&E, now I'm retired, but uh, PG&E sees about 2,000 2,000 strikes a day. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Florida is particularly bad. I, I remember being in a grocery store uh, last summer and uh, wandering around with my mom, and all of a sudden, wham, and the lights go off for about 20 seconds, and 
everything in the RF field with uh, counterpoises if needed, and uh, ditch all those ground rods, except for the lightning aspect, and have fun on the radio. As we did at CQP, this was our uh, last year's CQP expedition, we had uh, how many stations? Four, uh, four active stations, four, four and a half. And uh, all of the four had amplifiers on them, some at 1,500 watts, some at 500 watts. And guess what? Nothing bad happened. Not a single ground. We were okay. So, with that, I'll take some questions. Yeah. Yeah, I have worked for another company for a while. We did calibration work. And the, one of the pieces of equipment I got at one time would not pass low noise test. I called up the manufacturer to find out why. So, oh, yeah, you need a ground rod hooked up to the radio, to the equipment. This had a spec of 120 dB. Single noise yes. Radio. Uh, yeah. And it would only do about 90. Uh -huh. So I stuck some studs in the ass to the <coughs> ground. It made 100. Yeah, well, it, it might work better. Might not. No guarantees. Yeah. You know, if you and have a lot of noisy people around, it's not going to work well. Hmm? I was amazed how much difference. Yeah, well, it, it, it very much depends on the environment. There's no guarantee it's yet. What's a chemical ground? Chemical ground? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, it's like a salt of those elements? Yeah, I don't know about that. It's kind of weird. Yeah, that, is, that sounds kind of weird. Uh, but of course, we have heard about artificial grounds from MFJ, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Which are nothing more than tuners. Uh, and so they're trying to tune your radials for you. Uh, Rick, yeah. Yeah, to give you an example, when I went to Rock, Check the best practice. 
historical code, they uh, want to ground uh, near your uh, house so that uh, the neutral in the electrical system will be close to the same potential that you get when you touch the wall faucet. Yeah, except for it doesn't really work very well. I have one of these old uh, uh, helicopters radios that has no transformer in it. And Ooh. I get a nice buzzy feeling when I touch that chest. <laughs> reverse, so the, reverse, really the reverse the plug. Reverse the plug, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it is, set, it is the right way. <laughs> the other one is worse. Yeah, exactly. The other one it really fights. This doesn't. Thank you. 